Uh, before introducing today's panelists, I'd like to make a few remarks myself to frame the issue of the liberal arts today, first recalling what we mean when we say liberal education and then suggesting some of the challenges that liberal education faces today. The liberal arts are, of course, an inheritance that stretches from us back to antiquity, and they've generally been understood to encompass two branches of learning. The first, the rhetorical, interpretive, expressive, which includes languages, literatures, music, visual arts, all taught as means to communicate wisdom, incubate independent judgment, educate the feelings, and cultivate the beautiful. The second branch, the philosophical, rational, intellectual, including logic, philosophy, mathematics, natural science, all taught to train the mind in disciplined inquiry after truths and in critical thinking. The key assumption underlying the liberal arts vision of education has been, of course, that broad rhetorical and philosophical learning, not narrowed to vocational training, develops both personal character and the qualities of mind that are needed in a free society. And the name liberal itself comes from this latter expectation that this education produces a person who is independent in thought and action and therefore is fitted to live in and sustain a free society. Now, liberal education has evolved over recent decades, adapting to several emerging challenges. Notable would be the claims of women not only to be admitted to the liberal arts, but also to have their intellectual and moral capacities recognized in the rationale for liberal arts education, as well as their experiences included in the arts and sciences that liberal education teaches. This is an evolution that is well known to all of us and is well underway. Notable, too, have been the claims for multiculturalism, claims that the materials embraced for, by liberal education should be widened to include more traditions than the direct heritages of Greece and Rome through Europe. And this, too, is an evolution that's underway uh, within a liberal arts education. Today, in my view, the principal challenge facing liberal education comes, rather, from surging demand for career-oriented instruction from a spike in careerist attitudes that's evident both in the minds of American students and in official and semi-official discourses on the national interest. With respect to the students themselves, every summer UCLA does a vast survey of college-bound high school graduates. And in the latest year for which I have data, which is 2009, 75% of college-bound students and 85% of their parents said college education was important because it prepared students for getting a job and raising their earnings potential. And this was the highest rate of that careerist response since the UCLA poll began in 1983. Now, students and parents focus on short-term utility for good reason, in that three trends have come together to uh, shift an ever higher financial burden to the student. First, college, uh, college tuition has for decades risen at an inflation rate far above cost of living rise. Second, that median inflation adjusted household income has fallen by nearly 7% since the year 2000. And third, public support to higher education institutions and students has dropped by nearly a third since the year 2000. Today, cumulative student debt is the second largest debt in the U.S., ahead of car loans, ahead even of credit card debt. It's smaller only than mortgage debt. With respect to the national interest, public discourse on education has moved strongly away from the liberal arts concern with educating men and women fit to live in and sustain a free society. One hears more and more about the need to train workers by tailoring collegiate programs to meet needs in vocational fields. So in Florida, for example, lawmakers are prodding the 12 state universities to find ways to steer students toward majors that are in demand in the job market. The governor's task force on higher education has suggested that lower tuition be charged for majors in strategic areas as calculated according to supply and demand. An engineering student would then pay less for a degree than a student studying history or literature. Or to give one more example, a Georgetown University report released in 2010 said this, 
An educational system in a market economy such as ours must align with the labor market. If higher education fails to focus on occupational training, it will damage the nation's economic future, something we cannot afford. The challenge for colleges is to overhaul the way they educate students, to much more closely align the curriculum with specific jobs. They should counsel students to pick programs of study based on careers, track the success of various curricula in preparing students for jobs, and adjust programs to assure that they're focused on jobs. It's all about alignment." End quote. So we need to ask, where does utility lie? Not just in the short run, but in the perspective of a lifetime. Where does the individual's lifelong benefit lie in personal terms, not just professional? And where does the public interest lie, with broadly educated citizens or with the alignment of education to employment? How can a case be made for the liberal arts uh, today? It's not particularly easy to put into words the advantages that we who have been liberally educated see in the education we've received. Just as Justice Potter Stewart said about pornography, we recognize them when we see them, but it's not particularly easy to generalize about them. It's experience, I think, that yields the best insights, and that's where our three panelists from the class of 1963 come in. Garrett Kirk, on my left, majored in economics at Williams, played basketball and wrote for the Williams record, and then went directly to business school, and upon graduating, spent a few decades in investment banking with a brief stint along the way in the Army. Today, he has one foot in the private business sector and another in the nonprofit sector for the arts, education, environment, and the developmentally disabled. Garrett and his family live in New York City. In the center, Woody Lockhart majored in English at Williams, played hockey, and was president of the Flying Club. He studied architecture for a time before beginning a 36-year career as a pilot with United Airlines, and along the way, earning a PhD in the history of art and architecture, which allowed him to pursue a dual career as a pilot and a college professor. He lives in Sausalito, California, where he has revived the acting career that he started as an undergraduate at Williams. <laughs> Paul Michel majored in political science at Williams, joined the swim team at Symphony, played drums for a variety of Williams jazz bands, and after graduating from law school, began a lifetime career in public service as a government lawyer. He served as investigator or prosecutor in national events that the rest of us experienced only in the daily news, Watergate, Koreagate, U.S. Senate's Church Committee, reform of the FBI. He served as chief of staff for the senator from his home state of Pennsylvania, and then he served 22 years on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, and Paul Michel lives in Alexandria, Virginia. So that's the panel. Take it, Garrett. Thank you, Carolyn. The value of a liberal arts education is measured by its ability to develop ideas and leaders that promote a healthy society. Our society is not healthy. Therefore, a liberal arts education does not have value. Is this measurement fair? Or, after all a Williams liberal art education did for me, should not I be the one accountable for a healthy society? Accountable to see that those who did not have the benefit of a Williams education have hope and the opportunity for a good life. Is our society healthy? According to one study, the wealthiest 10% of Americans took 149% of the growth in income between 2009 and 2011. The bottom 90% saw their income shrink. The poverty rate is 15%, almost one out of seven. And for children under 18, 22%, over one out of five. The obesity rate for adults is 36%, over one out of three. We can debate how to measure the value of a liberal arts education. We can debate the health of our society or we can focus on what a Williams liberal arts education can do to improve our society. What do we need? 
We need new ideas and new habits. Ideas shape the world, and the idea that will shape this century is sustainability. What is sustainability? Sustainability is a code of behavior or habits. Solon was wise enough to have discovered long ago that it is more important to form good habits than frame good laws. The cornerstones of this behavior or these habits are three. One, long-term thinking, 50 years. Two, teamwork. Three, return on investment. Mars is going to have all its cocoa production sustainable by 2020. Why? Long-term thinking. It wants to be in business 100 years from today. How? Teamwork. It is working with the producers, providing education, health care, technology to raise their standard of living and increase yields. The goal? Return on investment and long-term profitability. Nestle, which purchases nearly 1% of the world's agriculture output, and Unilever, the world's largest tea company, have similar goals. As these examples indicate, the sustainability movement is being led by the private sector and also the NGOs like the Rainforest Alliance. Rainforest Alliance certified farms produce 4% of the world's coffee, 10.2% of the world's cocoa, 11.2% of the world's tea, and 15% of the world's bananas. The public sector and the schools do not share the same urgency and focus demonstrated by the private sector and the NGOs. Is this an opportunity for Williams to show leadership? The class of 1963 Sustainability Development Fund is directed at this opportunity. To use Jim Bloom's words, a venture capital fund to fund field trips and the development of new courses and programs that promote an understanding of sustainability from a scientific, economic, ethical, and social perspective. Professor Henry Art, the Robert F. Rosenberg Professor of Biology and Environmental Studies, has given the fund a terrific start. In January of this year, he led a student field trip to experience and study the incredible diversity of the agriculture practices of California, followed by a tutorial entitled The Ecology of Sustainable Agriculture. There is no doubt that student behavior and habits which trips and courses like Professor Arts encourages will help promote a healthy society and by this measure give a Williams liberal arts education value. And Solon would smile. Thank you. As an airline pilot, I had a very long and very satisfying career in a profession which is highly specialized, very technical, and one for which my Williams education would seem to have very little relevance. <laughs> I was an English major at Williams, an English major who never took a math course. The only aviation-related course that I ever took was a course in the astronomy department in celestial navigation. <laughs> And by the time I actually was in a position to make use of it, everything I'd learned was obsolete <laughs> in that particular course. When I came to Williams, as freshman, 1959, I had virtually no concept of what a liberal arts education was or what it was all about. I was principally attracted to the college because they had a flying club, actually the oldest college flying club in the country. By the time I graduated four years later, 1963, I think I did have a pretty good idea of what a liberal arts education uh, was all about. Uh, I knew that I had learned how to learn. I was convinced that I could learn anything I wanted to learn. I also had continued my flying through the flying club, and by the time I graduated, I had a commercial pilot's license and roughly a thousand hours of flight time, enough to qualify me for a job as a professional airline pilot. However, that was out of the question, because at that time, the military and all of the airlines required 2020 vision uncorrected to be even, you couldn't even apply if you didn't have that. I didn't have that, so I didn't give much thought at all to a, a career as a professional pilot. During my senior year, I had read Ayn Rand's book, The Fountainhead, and I decided maybe I could be an architect, so. <laughs> 
For reasons unknown to me, I still don't understand why I was ever accepted because I had no background in anything architectural either at Williams. Uh, I was accepted and I went off to architecture school. Well, within a year, year and a half, it soon became clear that I was not going to be the next Frank Lloyd Wright. It also happened that uh, United Airlines became the first airline to lower the eye requirements to say you didn't have to have 2020 vision uncorrected. If it was correctable to 2020 and no worse than 2050, uh, that was good enough. So I decided to give that a try and I submitted my application. I was invited down to Kennedy Airport for an interview. And the pilot who interviewed me was a crusty old captain who had actually begun his career as an open cockpit airmail pilot. He had actually been Lindbergh's roommate bef before Lindbergh flew the Atlantic in 1927. And he chatted with me and looked at my log books and, and uh, looked at my licenses and admitted that I had those requirements. But he then said to me, he said, uh, son, I see you were an English major. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I uh, would like you to know that the people that we hire are either all ex-military pilots or they have come from an aviation background in a, what amounts to a trade school, a school either specializing in aviation or in aeronautics. So why would I have any interest in hiring an English major? <laughs> so I said to him, I said, well, sir, what I learned in college, among other things, was how to face a problem or a challenge, how to analyze it, how to resolve it, and then how to communicate what I'd learned about that in the process. And I think maybe that's the kind of person you might want to have flying your airplanes. He thought about that for a minute and he said, okay, I, you sold me, I'll give you a shot. Then he said something that was very interesting. He said, I've been in this business a long time and it's very obvious to me that aviation is changing so rapidly that the people we hire today who come to us with just aviation related skills uh, are going to be obsolete themselves in a very short period of time. And we need to have people with a general background who can adapt to the changing circumstances that they're going to find uh, in the world of commercial flying. And he couldn't have been more correct because when I started with United in 1965, we had, in addition to pilots in the cockpit, we had flight engineers and we had navigators. Uh, within five years, they were all gone, completely made obsolete by, by automation. And over the course of my 36-year career, I saw other changes as well. Many of the skills that I would have learned if I had taken courses in aviation and aeronautics uh, would have been completely useless to me. Even the basic skills of flying the airplane are really no longer necessary, some would say. <laughs> <laughs> it's now entirely possible for the pilot to program the computer, which has taken over everything in the airplanes, program that on the ground, get the airplane in the air, sit back, put his hands in his lap and not touch anything again until the airplane is on the runway at wherever they're going. Boeing has just developed a new autopilot that will allow anybody in the cockpit to flip a switch in the event of a hijacking and at that point the airplane is no longer able to be controlled from the air. It is now going to be controlled from the ground by somebody on the ground. So the pilot is not even a necessary factor. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anymore in the, in the entire uh, equation. Well, I've often reflected upon the fact that given the kind of obsolescence that was built into the aviation industry, it's changing almost every day, that my Williams education, my English major education, uh, prepared me perfectly for that career. It also, I think, prepared me uh, and this is almost more important in my thinking today, it, pre it prepared me for retirement. Uh, as a pilot, I knew from day one that I would have to retire at age 60. That was government-mandated retirement age, uh, long before I was probably ready to retire. And it's a sad fact, but at 60, at the, the day before your 60th birthday, if you're an airline pilot, you're, you're at the top of your profession. <laughs> the next day, you're out of a job, and you're old news. And that's a very tough situation for many people who have not developed other interests. And we had many pilots who didn't have other interests. Flying was all they knew, it's all they wanted to do. And when it came time to retire, they were devastated. We had a number of suicides actually uh, following uh, forced early retirement. Retirement age has now been changed to 65, but it was 60. 
Uh, and I have often reflected that my Williams education really did prepare me for a successful retirement. A couple of courses that I took in art history I planted the seed that uh, maybe I'd be interested in that. So I went on and got a graduate degree in the history of art. And as was mentioned, I had a dual career as a professor of art history as well as, a, as, as being a pilot. I've also managed to revive my theatrical career, which I began here. And I don't know how I ever had time to go to work. <laughs> So I'm, I apologize if this has been too personal, but I feel so strongly uh, about the value of a liberal arts education and the fact that it is relevant today and will be relevant tomorrow that uh, I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Well, done, well I uh, spent... Uh, 44 years in public service in one position after another uh, following the graduation from law school. Uh, and my observation as a result of the many experiences along the road is that actually a liberal arts education is way more needed today than when we started here. And that's because our society has become a society of specialists, of special interests, of special pleading, of distorted claims and arguments made by many different factions. And the ability to uh, analyze and compare and contrast and reconcile those kind of uh, pleadings is critical to not only successful governance at the official level, but the governance of every institution, public, private, profit, nonprofit, uh, you name it. So when I look back uh, on the 44 years, uh, I feel that I got here uh, in this valley actually everything that I needed through eight different public jobs, which I'll briefly uh, describe. I got the foundation that I used every day for 44 years and still use. Uh, I came here actually with a very specific goal in mind. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I knew I wanted to be in public service. I knew I wanted to become part of the national government at some point. I had this idea that uh, properly utilized uh, law could be a great uh, engine for uh, resolving social disputes, uh, ordering society uh, optimally, um, redressing injustices and imbalances, and so forth. So uh, uh, I, I knew what I wanted to do in that sense, and in another sense, I had no idea at all how to get there or how to prepare for that. So of course, on autopilot, I majored in political science. But I took lots of other courses, as liberal arts students do. I took a lot of art courses, a lot of music courses, a lot of history courses, uh, some science courses, uh, astronomy, uh, uh, and it all ended up coming in extremely handy. So from our wonderful teachers and the intense personal experience that all of us have had here with at least a handful of very dedicated men and women, they may or may not be famous, they may or may not author lots of books and win lots of prizes, but they care about students, they invest their time, their intellect, and their energy in close personal encounters with us. The famous log with Mark Hopkins and the student is uh, not just a, a, a historical uh, uh, artifact, it's a daily reality here in Williamstown, and that's the heart of the whole uh, matter, uh, I think. So uh, here uh, in the four years, uh, I learned how to be skeptical, how to probe, how to uh, discern trends, how to get a sense of the timing of evolving circumstances, how to think independently, critically. I learned about trade-offs. I learned about the importance of balance and how hard it is to optimize balances when you have conflicting goals or conflicting forces, which basically describes almost everything in the outside world, I think. So uh, the other thing that I learned was the importance of trying to make a contribution by moving regularly toward the front edge of what was happening in whatever profession you ended up in. So I didn't really have a career. I guess I was a job hopper. Uh, I had eight different jobs over uh, the, the time since uh, law school. Um, uh, and uh, so it, it wasn't a plan. It was just a, a good luck and, and good preparation. 
Uh, I learned how to learn really fast about things that I knew nothing about. Uh, and as you'll see from a few of my examples, uh, uh, they get pretty extreme. But I want to start uh, a little bit of the personal biography by relating uh, briefly uh, an encounter I had with my first non-family mentor. One winter morning in 1962, a handful of government officials drove up here from Washington, all Williams alums, to talk to students who might be interested in government careers. One was CIA Director Richard Helms. Uh, another was uh, the head of policy planning at the State Department at the time, a man named Ben Reed, a, a post-war graduate of Williams. Like so many, came out of the service, came here, uh, got his education, and went on to be a star and hold many high posts. So by luck, I sat next to him at the breakfast table. And we had a long, extended conversation. Six months later, I was in his office in Washington. And I'm not making this up. In between phone calls with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara and Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Ben Reed talked to me for 45 minutes <laughs> about how to start a career in the government, how to, how to get the first foothold. And I thought, this is, incra this is crazy. This guy doesn't have time to be talking to me. I'm just a college kid. But that's the kind of dedication that Williams people get into their DNA and take with them when they leave this valley and go on to other things. It was a great uh, start. He told me, uh, you should become a trial lawyer because that will teach you, uh, on top of what you already learned here, how to learn about lots of different things, different specialties, expert witnesses and all that, and it'll be great training. And the second thing that he said uh, is that uh, uh, once you've done that, you've got to migrate into new places where you can use those kind of fast learning skills. So I went to law school. I went to work as a public prosecutor in Philadelphia. Uh, I went to court every day for several years. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, trial and error, <laughs> doing trials. Uh, <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes, but I, I really learned a lot. It was an extraordinary experience. So when I got out of law school, the Warren Court had revolutionized in just a few years in the mid-60s, uh, constitutional law, particularly as it uh, related to law enforcement and prosecution and so forth. So the police and prosecutors were totally stymied. So I came out of law school as this green prosecutor, but I had studied all these cases in great detail and had been well-schooled in them. So I got involved in trying to help other prosecutors and the police and other enforcement agencies learn how to comply with these new requirements but still be successful in their job of controlling crime. It was really very interesting. Then uh, I migrated into a different aspect in the second part of my tenure as a local prosecutor because police corruption was becoming more of a national concern. The NAP Commission in New York and uh, other uh, such uh, uh, revelations showed that there were systemic problems of corruption in police departments in almost every city in America. So I became a police corruption investigator uh, in Philadelphia. And following that, it shifted uh, into uh, investigating high-level public officials suspected of uh, uh, corruption, bribery, uh, extortion, uh, and the rest. So I ended up, although uh, still not yet 30, investigating the mayor of Philadelphia, half the members of the city council, and the entire police department. It was, <laughs> it, it was quite a good experience. Uh, w when that came to an end, uh, I ended up uh, jobless for a couple days and then got hired by Leon Jaworski, who had su succeeded Pro Professor Cox as the special prosecutor in the middle of the Watergate scandal investigations. So I ran an investigation that was uh, aptly called the Hughes-Rebozo investigation, Howard Hughes, the billionaire, and Bibi Rebozo, the banker, president, uh, a friend of the president. So I had really lots of interesting times uh, with that investigation. Uh, it turned out that uh, cash, uh, always in $100 bills, always in valises, were being deposited with Rosemary Woods and Rebozo by various super rich people like Howard Hughes, but not only Hughes, uh, DeWitt Wallace, uh, Dwayne Andreas, Adnan Khashoggi, some of these names may even be familiar to you. So um, uh, that was a great uh, learning experience capped by getting a chance to question uh, former President Nixon then. Uh, in front of the grand jury in San Clemente, where, by the way, the pleasant part of the experience was dealing with his then press secretary, Diane Sawyer. <laughs> and she was as charming and nice and professional as you could imagine. 
President Nixon was a little more irascible. <laughs> um, this job, again, kind of naturally led, uh, but uh, blindly uh, still, to working with the so-called Church Committee, the original Senate Intelligence Committee, because of revelations that the intelligence agencies had gone off the mainstream to an extent and were spying on American citizens uh, on a fairly extensive basis. So I spent uh, more time, again, in sort of an investigative mode like Watergate and the Philadelphia investigations. Um, and uh, one of the ironies is that uh, having met Richard Helms when uh, he came here that winter weekend, uh, ended up uh, interrogating him in front of the church committee. <laughs> he later introduced me at a cocktail party to some friends of his as, I'd like you to meet my tormentor. <laughs> But he was very civil and gentlemanly about it uh, at the same time. So we, we were investigating things like NSA mass eavesdropping on communications of American citizens. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> we were investigating FBI spying on domestic peace groups and other uh, pr relatively harmless uh, groups. And uh, again, echoing what's happening today, I was deeply involved in an investigation of how the Nixon White House was misusing the IRS to investigate political enemies. <laughs> so as you can see, these problems have a sort of permanent continuing nature to them, and they tend to be cyclical. We, we, you know, we, we focus on them, we put in some fixes, we pass some new laws, we do whatever needs to be done, and then we go away and the attention wanders, and then the problem recurs and gets worse and worse and worse, and then we, we have another cycle of the peaks uh, and valleys. Uh, after that, uh, I went to the Justice Department and ended up running an investigation uh, that Carolyn correctly referred to as Koreagate, although it had a lot of differences uh, from Watergate, because here the alleged malfactors were, this is an awful number, but this is actually the number that was on the front page of the Washington Post, 110 members of Congress suspected of having received illegal money from uh, uh, agents of the Korean Central Intelligence Agency and from a businessman, Korean American businessman, named might be familiar, Tang Sun Park. So uh, this uh, taught me a lot about the sort of dirty side of lobbying on Capitol Hill. And Korea was not the only country that uh, was tempted to uh, engage in this kind of thing. So those all were investigative jobs where I had to learn and dig and ask probing questions and piece together mosaics of very complicated facts over the resistance of all the people involved because, of course, uh, none of them wanted to go to jail if they could avoid it. The next four jobs that I ended up having were quite different. They all involved management and policy invol involving large institutions. So uh, uh, I went to work uh, in the Deputy Attorney General's office and got involved in trying to help to provide appropriate authority on the one hand, but appropriate guidance and limits on the other hand for the conduct of operations at the FBI and other law enforcement agencies, the Marshal Service and uh, so forth. Uh, and I was involved in uh, drafting a, a proposed legislative charter for the FBI with these twin goals in mind and ended up testifying 13 times in front of Congress about uh, the value of, of this approach. And in the end, it was never passed, but uh, the, the guts of it were embedded in guidelines which uh, exist to this day, but here we go again, obviously need to be tuned up again because of the recent revelations of uh, excessive uh, intrusion into the uh, activities of reporters at the Associated Press and Fox News. So uh, again, recurring problems uh, 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 and uh, a great education for me. Uh, I then went to the Senate, uh, working for Senator Specter, my home state senator, as Carolyn uh, noted. I got involved in every imaginable uh, national issue, although I knew nothing about any of them. Uh, nuclear arms control, coal mine safety, whether the Japanese yen was uh, undervalued and we should take countermeasures, and on and on and on. Hundreds and hundreds of different issues. Every day was a race of your, can your brain catch up uh, with what you need to know to advise a, a busy senator. Again, a great education. And then finally, 22 years on a semi-specialized appellate court. Uh, that deals uh, principally with intellectual property matters which have become increasingly important in our adult uh, lifetimes. Once again, uh, 
preparation in science, technology, engineering. Well, let's see, I took two physics courses, astronomy, pretty minimal. But I had learned how to learn, both here and later. And so I'm reading expert, trans expert witness transcripts and extraordinarily complicated disputes involving biotech engineering and you name it, uh, but without uh, too much trouble because of all this uh, ramp up and uh, preparation. So my final career, which is what I'm pursuing now, is I'm a private citizen for the first time uh, in the 47 years since I graduated from law school. I retired three years ago for one simple reason. I loved being a judge, I loved every day of it, I intended to stay forever. They were gonna have to carry me out of the courthouse in a pine box with a smile on my face. I changed my mind because federal judges, sitting federal judges, for good and sufficient reasons, are not supposed to be engaged in public debate on political issues, controversial issues, big national policy issues, uh, et cetera, with some very narrow exceptions. So I stepped down from the court, gave up life tenure, which amazed a lot of people, uh, and my new career is I'm a public scold. <laughs> so now I'm free to criticize the Congress, the Supreme Court, my old court, people in the White House and various administrations, and I do it, and I'm really enjoying it a lot. And, <laughs> and in this job, too, I use my Williams education every day. So I end where I started. I think liberal arts education is the best preparation at least for the kind of life that I ended up leading and the sort of careers or jobs that I've had. And it, it not only is needed, it's desperately needed and we should keep it alive. Thank you. Well, we've been very disciplined up here, so we could leave a good chunk of time for discussion from, and comments from the audience. We're hoping that we can have some lively exchanges. And we've arranged for a microphone to, if you want to start it down here. Oh, we'll start it down here with, OK. Um, and we have about, you know, we have more than 15 minutes. so. We're going to start here, and then we're going to go up to this hand that is up in the, in the back row. Bill? Um, I think the theme was very clear of the panelists of the value of a liberal arts education to reinvent yourself, uh, which is increasingly demanded. And I just wanted to give a counterpoint uh, and ask a question to the audience. Um, I know of one member of our class who's at the other end from you guys uh, and me, who's not been in reinventing and reinventing. He's worked for one employer his entire career. One employer. And that used to not make news. Mm -hmm. But I just want to ask, other members of the class of 63, anybody who has worked for one employer your whole career? Yeah, it's really interesting. Not very many. Not many. Not many. And I think if we were to do, and I won't do it, if we were to do it with the class of 88, you'd have many fewer. Mm -hmm. right. And I just think that that is one thing we should keep in mind is the importance of be, having the skill set to be able to adapt that way because you will have to. Yeah, good. Thank you. That's a very strong argument. We're coming with the microphone. <laughs> Okay. And everybody can hear me. Here to an extent. To an extent, you're preaching to the choir in this room. What is your best advice as to how we can spread the importance of the liberal education? You talked about the things in Florida. That's awful. What can we do to impress upon the people that have power the value of the continued liberal education. Paul, do you have an idea from your knowledge? Of well, uh, I mentioned Ben Reed, who came here on the GI Bill in the late 40s, uh, a wave of many, many students who came on that pathway. I think it's time for the country to invest in its future. We obviously need to do a lot about infrastructure, 
We need to do a lot about uh, financing education, and it's not easy. Um, for those uh, who, who uh, can't get here uh, with their own individual financing, and that's a lot of people, and it's very important for diversity and breadth and so on, uh, I think it's time for the country to consider another GI Bill-like financing of college education uh, for people who've provided service to the country, whether it's military service or some other type of valuable service domestically, uh, it would be a great investment now, just as it was in, in the era after World War II. Uh, there's one over here, but I, I'd like to add to that that you know advocacy can come from the top down. Advocacy can also come from the grassroots up. And if we are the choir and we're the grassroots, we very likely have an audience in our families, which may be our grandchildren. For some of you, it may be your children. For some of us, it's our grandchildren. And I think um, they are going to be subject to all of the pressures that that I've mentioned and, and others to go in a, in, a, in a different direction. And I think if we can pass on to them what we've heard today about the value of liberal arts education, that's something that, that we can do in addition to working with, with uh, public, uh, public officials. Uh, there was somebody over here. I'm more... Uh impressed with the Williams of today in regard to the perspective they provide on a worldwide basis. Mm -hmm. And I think that from my perspective, that's, that's an important addition to a liberal education. I didn't see it, nor did I experience it when I was a student as, mm -hmm. as much. And that's perhaps I was re a relative Yahoo but at the same time, I'm wondering if I missed something in our era that Williams provided similar to what's being provided today. You're the Williams guys. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't have any be better answer than you. I mean, I'm, I'm going to divert just for a minute. And by, I feel that the uh, liberal arts education that we have, to, like things are changing. I personally feel it needs a little more juice. And there are certain things like the economic model and other things that are just not going to work over the long term. And it's ironic to me that we have all these opportunities and no jobs. You know, there's, there's this basic disconnect here. So uh, if you look at some of the numbers, the financial sector of the economy went from like 10% to 40% of the economy. <coughs> the graduates of the liberal arts schools like Harvard and Princeton, over half, 60, 70% are going into management consulting and Wall Street. The basic outlook of Wall Street is short term. And when you've got... 40% of the economy going into this. I mean, Paul Volcker, inter interim guy, he had a jo job from Boeing and Goldman Sachs. He's an engineer. Boeing offered him 80,000, Goldman offered 250, and he goes to work for Goldman Sachs. I mean, how the hell does this work over the long term? Now, what are the implications for the liberal arts education? I think the liberal arts education is, it, it is accountable for more than just us, you know? God, we had a great time. Life is great for us. Said, what about everybody else here on this thing? And how do we get involved and how do we do something? Now, personally, I view this as an opportunity. Uh, I've been involved with this sustainability thing, thanks to my wife, for about 10 years now, and I've gotten involved in the high school. But I see a lot of opportunities out there. And these things are happening out there, and they need people like Williams College, Prince, whatever, without, without having half their graduates going into Wall Street and McKinsey. Now, how, how do we do something about that? Well, I, I, I wouldn't pretend to have all the answers, but I think that's a problem. And I think if you look back to the Greeks and the Romans, you know, the great thinkers were just getting going at 60. 
They were pro <laughs> No, this is true. They were providing wisdom for the rest of the society on this thing. And so I think there's, there's a real opportunity here for the wood bill. And that doesn't mean to change the whole curriculum. But to get more, I feel sort of involved in this and where are the opportunities and what have to be done. The reason I got interested at the high school level was, and to a certain extent at college level, those people are six, 16, 17 years old. So in 60 years, you know, they're going to be 60, they're going to be interested if you're talking about 50 years. I, I sit around talking to them, you know, 50 years from today, you know, we're not going to be around 50 years. So I, anyway, that's a long-winded answer. And I think, yeah, obviously the world's changed in terms of all this global energy and everything else. And people say to me, well, you know, the 21st century is China's century. Well, by what measure? Number of people? I agree with you 100%. <laughs> Economy? I agree with you. Well, what about for ideas and energy? You know, that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what Williams College is supposed to be doing. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. While you may be preaching to the choirs, I think it's always a, a important to have a little contrarian uh, uh, expressions. And I am concerned as perhaps reflected by the three members on this panel, as opposed to the panel yesterday morning, uh, that your science was astrology, did you? Uh, or astronomy. <laughs> Mumbling. And particularly in the context that currently less than 17% of high school students choose a major uh, of science technology, engineering, or math, as opposed to in China, where it is uh, well over 60%. And I'm concerned in terms of focusing on a liberal arts education without considering that second portion that uh, you, uh, you discussed. Yeah. And how should Williams, as well as other institutions, change the models so that we have an emphasis on STEM, science, technology, right. engineering, and math. Right. Yes, thank you. I don't think that's really a contrarian view. The reason that I put out the definition of liber liberal arts that I did was so that the natural sciences, mathematics, that's part of it. And there's, there's not, there's no more excuse for somebody going through only on the expressive track and not having their mathematics and science than there is for somebody going in a technical education with, you know, without the humanities. I think it really is key that a student have both. Now, my history majors, I make sure that they have, you know, that they have their science and they have their math and they have their statistics and they have their econ, you know, to go, to go out with. And, and I think that's a very important point, that that's really what a liberal arts education is. It's the crossover, it's the combination. Now, one of the things that institutions can do, although they have a hard time doing it, is um, requiring breadth of students. And, you know, particularly universities have, have trouble doing this, um, including my own university. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum is, is something that I find really appalling, which is the willingness of undergraduate institutions to defer to, to individual student choice. So there are some colleges, which we all know, and that aren't very far from here, and that we used to consider liberal arts colleges that I don't consider liberal arts anymore because they've done away with requirements. And they say students can do, you know, students will learn better if they can you know, study what they're interested in. I think that's an entire ab abdication of faculty responsibility. And if you look at the outcomes from those places, people do not come out with, with the broad liberal arts education. So uh, I, I'm not sure what the, what the current Williams model is. I suspect that it, liberal arts is anchored right into the curriculum with these kinds of breadth requirements. But that is one thing that institutions can do and should have this even-handed view that, you know, the humanities students need their science, and the science students need their humanities, and that's what liberal arts education really is. I'd like to add something to that. Uh, as I mentioned, I 
have been teaching, I'm still teaching actually at a university near San Francisco. Uh, when I started teaching there in the mid-70s, it was a college, and it literally was a very fine liberal arts college. They still pay lip service to the term liberal arts. They still call themselves a liberal arts school, but it is not a liberal arts school anymore. It's very much the sort of thing that, that Carolyn is talking about. And I feel very strongly that uh, those institutions which are solid liberal arts colleges, like, like Williams, have to work very, very hard to maintain uh, that traditional definition of what a liberal arts education is all about. It's very easy to continue to pay lip service to the term, but to not require the students to take these interdisciplinary courses where you learn that whatever you learn in one course, you can apply that to another course in a completely different field. And when I mentioned that I was an English major that never took a math course, uh, when I decided to go to architecture school, well, of course I had to have a math course, so I took a, a course in calculus. I didn't take it at Williams, but uh, I figured I could, uh, I learned how to learn. I figured I could learn calculus. I did. It wasn't a problem at all. So I think that the interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary learning that you get at a good liberal arts school is, is the key. And I, I really do second exactly what you were saying. Where do we have the microphone? Yeah, it's, a, it's up here. Uh, I was having a discussion last night with a couple... <clears throat> I, I was having a discussion last night with a couple classmates, and we were talking about the value, and I was challenging this, of the telecourse. I mean, he oh. was talking about how many young people now were able to kind of benefit from, you know, telecourses. I should alert you, though, as you begin to respond to this, and I hope you will, uh, I have a very impressionable seven-month-old who is listening very carefully <laughs> to, to what you're about to say. Uh, my university is going, uh, jumping in with both feet into um, distance learning, or now they're called MOOCs, if you know what MOOCs are, mass open online, online. online <laughs> courses, yeah. Um, and I think the jury is, com is completely out on this. Um, I think there's a lot of experimentation going on. I think the question of how effective this kind of learning can be, what, what fields can this <coughs> kind of learning or teaching be, uh, instruction be effective, I think it probably is easier to do in some fields than in others. And um, there are efforts to make these courses not just delivery, but to set up online discussion groups and crowdsourcing, they call it, and so on. Um, and I, you know, it's possible that this could, in, in some period of time, revolutionize higher education. But it's also possible, if it isn't done right, that it, that it could really be disastrous, especially for the kind of education that, that, we're, um, that we're talking about this morning. Did you have another aspect of it that you wanted us to respond to? Or oh, it's, it's a seven-month-old grandson, not a son. <laughs> well, he, he, he will know the answer when it's time for him to. <laughs> to choose his educational model. You know, Carolyn, I think it's very important to uh, throw overboard the idea that there has to be a one, one model, one size fits all for uh, college level education in the United States. We have a lot of diversity now. I think uh, it provides a good laboratory where certain things that work will survive and prosper. Other things that maybe don't work as well will gradually fade away. That may be uh, that there's something to what the Florida people say and what that Georgetown uh, study said for many students because mm -hmm. uh, not everybody can afford four years at a liberal arts college, maybe followed by several years of graduate school. So maybe for a lot of people, uh, at that age, it, it's useful to have something, whether it's online or partly online or shorter than four years, more affordable, fine. But that has nothing to do with whether the, there's also a need for a college like Williams to continue to do what it does so well. 
That's a good note to end on, and our time is up. And I want to thank the panel and thank the audience. And I want to mention two more things. One has to do with the chart that we handed out. This was a chart that actually appeared, you may have seen it, in, the, in last fall's issue of the Williams Magazine. And I was quite taken with it, because not only is it quite beautiful, but it is a very creative and convincing visualization of the way that liberal arts education opens onto a wide arc of career paths. And so I thought I would get it into your hands so you can take it with you and, and, and really uh, give it a good close look. Um, it, I don't know if I mentioned, it's done by two undergraduate math majors at Williams. The second thing I want to remind us of is that one of the most eloquent and incisive interpreters and allies of liberal education anywhere was John Sawyer, who was president of Williams for the class of 1963. Uh, you may have seen quotations uh, from Sawyer in this past spring's Williams magazine and commentaries on his quotations from current uh, Williams faculty, which gives us a sense of the strength of liberal education here today. Um, so I want to close this session with a quotation from President Sawyer that speaks directly to uh, the topic as we've developed it today. This is what he said. American higher education has to be mindful that the vocational demands of an increasingly complicated c civilization not cut away some essentials of the liberal arts program. We have to mount the defenses to protect and preserve the range and variety and richness of the undergraduate years to keep the liberal arts core, which has been its traditional strength, remaining at the heart of the enterprise. Students now entering our institutions are going to be carrying responsibilities and facing problems that simply cannot be foreseen. The elasticity of the liberal arts type of education, awaking the capacity to see and understand and respond over a wide arc, is the kind of education that I feel very deeply is the most durable and most practical training we can give." End quote. So thank you for coming. Thank you.